We're assigning action cubes and gathering shard tokens. That's right, it's Runar from Ludus Magnus Studios. In this Clash of Clans campaign game, players take on the role of Viking hunting parties, each searching for the valuable runic shards in an attempt to honor and please the Asgardian gods. Through a series of battles, they'll fight and maneuver around the frozen tundra, gathering shards of the stones, all in an aim to wield the power of the legendary runic gem, the Runar. Since Runar is a campaign game, the player group proceeds through five scenarios, and setup will vary depending on their progress. At the end of each game, the player with the most victory points wins. Victory points come from gathering shard tokens, dealing damage and knocking out opposing heroes, building a statue to honor the gods, duh, and fulfilling objectives on mission and event cards. Before a campaign starts, players must first assemble their war band by taking a player board of one clan and three bases of one color. The player must then select three heroes. There is a suggestion for first timers on page 10. Each hero has a model and a double-sided card Explorer side up as denoted with the blue banner on the top left. The hero cards have name and art, speed value on the top left, defense on the bottom, a skill in the text box, and a personal pool on the top right. The legend side of these cards include additional abilities such as a feat, a powerful passive ability, and bonus action cubes and skill symbols. More on those shortly. Players complete their warband by filling out the campaign sheet according to the instructions on page 12. This sheet tracks the game's progress and the hero's development from game to game. Players can place their hero minis on their bases, setting the position tokens matching those bases on the appropriate hero card. Each player sets one agility cube, strength cube, and instinct cube into their action pool on their player board. Setup begins with the scenario card. In the first game of a Runar campaign, this is the 1A card. Otherwise, follow the instructions on the campaign sheet from the previous game. Read the intro aloud, then place the destiny board and put each player's point token on the zero space of the points tracker. Shuffle the destiny cards into a single deck. Take the event cards indicated on the scenario card, depending on the number of players in your game. Return the rest to the box. Then divide the destiny deck into a number of smaller decks according to the number of players. In our case, eight decks with three cards each. Place an event card on each of these decks, shuffle them separately, then form a single deck by stacking them. Place this destiny deck on the destiny board. Next, set up the battlefield board, which is divided into territories equal to the number of players in the game. In our case, four. Each territory is associated with the clan, as noted with the animal in the corner. A territory is further divided into four zones, each containing nine nodes. Stay with me, a node is where a model or obstacle might be placed. That node is considered occupied and no other model may be there, although they might be able to move through. Nodes are considered adjacent in any of the eight directions. Set the trackers for each of the yellow and blue shard tracks on the zero slots. If any heroes have a shield icon, they gain a shield token at this time. In the first Runar game, or in the case of a game where the Nemesis won previously, assign the first player token randomly. Otherwise, it's given to the winner of the previous game. Individually, players will shuffle the action cards of all their heroes in their clan to form a single action deck, placing it on their player board. If there is a nemesis symbol on the scenario card, set the nemesis board nearby and set the nemesis token on the zero slot of the Trail of Fate. Follow the setup instructions on the scenario card to place any enemy cards. The first player selects one of the battlefield layout options from the layout chapter of the rules, depending on their preferred game duration and setup. Following the icons on the layout, place heroes, obstacles, statues, and other tokens onto the board. Separately shuffle and place the inspiration cards and advantage cards. 
Each player also takes the three pieces of their statue, placing one advantage card beneath the body, one inspiration card under the head, and a shard token under the flame. If any other instructions are on the scenario card provided, follow those now. Otherwise, each player draws six cards from their action deck, choosing three to keep to form their starting hand, and returns the other three to the bottom of their deck. Gameplay occurs in turns, beginning with the first player and proceeding clockwise. Turns are divided into six phases. Tactical phase, actions phase, support phase, destiny phase, nemesis phase, and end of turn phase. First up in the tactical phase. The active player spins action cubes from their pools, either action pool or a hero's personal pool, to perform tactics. Each tactic has an action cube cost, and the white wild cube can be substituted for any other. Some tactics include command, where a player spins an instinct cube to draw three cards from their action deck and then discards down to three cards. Action cards have an action area and a support area. These are used in the next phase. Charge. For an agility cube, the player chooses one of their heroes that has no adjacent opposing models or shard tokens. That hero may be placed on a node of a zone orthogonally adjacent to their current zone. Fortify, which brings a hero's defense tokens up to their maximum as listed on their hero card and build, which can only be used once per turn, but adds a segment to their personal statue in their territory. For an incremental cost, starting at two cubes, the player builds first the body, then the head, and finally, the flame. This tactic can only be used if there is at least one event slot open on the destiny board. More on statues in a sec. Additionally, the equip and store actions are free tactics, allowing heroes to exchange items from within their treasury. Next, in the action phase, the player plays an action card from their hand, setting it in the turn action card slot. The featured hero is the active hero for this turn. They add action cubes, as listed in the action area, to the action pool. The player may now use action cubes for actions, including the standard actions for each cube type and potentially a once per turn skill on their turn card. For the agility cube, the player may use a movement, push, or throw action. Movement provides travel between nodes equal to the speed value of that hero, one point for orthogonal movement and two for diagonal. They must obey obstruction rules, obviously. Push allows a player to shove an enemy in a straight line. Throw moves a shard token. If a shard is moved off of the map, it's added to the destiny board. Strength cubes provide collect, attack, and trigger actions. Collect allows a hero to collect a blue shard token in their node or an adjacent node and add it to their destiny board. It also increases their shard tracker count on their player board. That player will also gain a victory point. Attack deals damage to an opposing model. Damage is dealt to defense tokens, if the model has any, then the defending hero may use reactions. More on those shortly. If neither of these steps stops the incoming damage, the defending player must hand an action card appropriate for that hero from their hand or bottom of their deck to the attacking player, who sets it in one of three damage areas. Once they have three different types of action cards in these areas, they discard one from each into the damage inflicted deck and score a victory point. If a hero has no more of their cards in an action deck or hand, that hero is knocked out. The attacking player gains a victory point. Trigger shoves a danger token one node in a straight line. These can even be shoved into opposing models dealing damage. Instinct cubes allow collect, defense, and response. This collect is similar to the strength action, but allows the collection of yellow shards. Defense and response are reactions that they may take on opposing turns when under attack, hoping to mitigate some of the damage. Response allows the player to find two more hero action cards from their deck before resolving that damage. Finally, wild cubes allow switch, 
destroy, and collect. This collect can grab any color shard, switch allows a player to switch active heroes, and destroy removes the highest non-body section of an opposing statue. After a hero's action cubes are spent, or the player doesn't wish to spend any more, the support phase begins. The turn card is placed in the player's discard, known as the memory. Any action cubes in the support area of the card are now added to the pool. Next, in the destiny phase. If any shard tokens are in the Destiny board's shard pool, the player with the fewest victory points draws and reveals a card from the Destiny deck. If it's an event card, it's placed in the leftmost slot of the event track and a shard token is discarded. Resolve any setbacks listed on the card and repeat this step if there are still shard tokens in the pool. If it's a Destiny card, that player adds it to the outer edge of their territory. The Destiny card lists a single node in each territory. The player may choose and place a shard token on that unoccupied spot. They then discard a shard from the shard pool, add a danger token to the node if there is one in the shard pool, and discard the Destiny card. Danger tokens just straight up deal damage. Neutral damage in the case of a player hitting it by their own action. Neutral damage places the discarded action card in a player's memory. Each rival player receives an advantage card. If a hero is KO'd by neutral damage, all opponents receive a victory point. Next, in the Nemesis phase. This step is skipped entirely if no Nemesis is present on the scenario card. Since this is our first game, we'll skip it too. But in later games, the players resolve the card in the Destiny discard pile, which indicates a target for an enemy model on the board, controlled by the Nemesis. In these games, the Nemesis also has its own turn, which takes place after the player to the right of the Nemesis board. See page 31 for resolving their actions. Finally, in the end of turn phase, the active player draws up to three cards into their hand, raises any KO'd heroes. For each hero raised, they draw an inspiration card into their hand. They also shuffle their newly raised heroes' action cards in the memory back into their action deck. Then, they draw and reveal a number of cards from the Destiny deck equal to the number of players in the game. Any Destiny cards are discarded, but an event card would be added to the leftmost space of the Destiny board. And if necessary, the top of the event card is resolved. If only one of the event slots are still open, and the active player is the last player before the first token holder takes a turn, then another card is drawn from the Destiny deck and resolved as before. Except a shard token is discarded from the shard pool. Any setbacks are applied as well. Then the next player's turn begins. Rounds continue with players activating heroes, collecting shards, shoving opponents, and knocking each other out. Here are a few additional game mechanics. Statues. These votive structures are built by clans to honor the gods and complete missions in the end game. They come in four parts, the base, the body, the head, and the flame. Once a section is built, the card beneath them can be acquired or used by the player, including that shard token for one victory point. Event cards reduce the shard tokens in the battlefield and act as a timer for the game. When event cards are placed on the destiny board, shard tokens are moved from the shard pool to the depository. The event cards reveal an enhancement or a setback in the upper portion and a mission in the lower portion. Missions provide in-game points for the players who fulfill their objective. The Nemesis. As we said, this opponent for all players has a turn right after the player to the right of the Nemesis board. Over three phases, the Nemesis absorbs power from the shard tokens or attacks heroes using the enemy models. Any choices that must be made by the Nemesis are made by the player with the fewest victory points. Good for them. They'll need that. The game ends once the first player's turn would begin, but the event slots are all occupied based on the number of players. Players gather their hand, action deck, and memory into a single deck. Then they take their inflicted damage with their damage area cards. 
Then the missions on the bottom of the events are checked and players are awarded VP. Any mission cards also award points and the player with the most VP wins. Then players are ranked by VP and mark their clan's position on the campaign sheet. And that's just the basics of Runar. Players can take these results and evolve their warband when advancing through the campaign, gaining new items, treasure, and upgrading their heroes to their legendary side. I'm Becca Scott, this is Good Time Society, and you have been such a great listener. Thanks for letting me explain this and not interrupting. It shows patience and maturity. And you can also show more maturity by subscribing to the channel, like this video, and come on back for more great games and good times. We'll see you soon.